Just because you're asymptomatic, does that actually make you healthy? In other words, just because you're not actively complaining about certain signs and symptoms of disease, or you haven't actually been diagnosed with any specific disease, are you actually healthy? Is there any room for improvement? Are you actually as healthy as you want to be? Are you as healthy as you can be? Ultimately, these are the kinds of things we want patients to ask themselves because at the end of the day, outside of an absolutely devastating diagnosis, the likelihood that most of us are gonna live into our 80s, 90s, or 100 plus is actually very high. I would say that it's gonna become very common for most of us to live well, well into our 90s and 100 plus. That's not really the question. It's not, am I gonna live a long life? most of you will live very long lives. The real question is, what's the quality of my life going to be when I get there? And that's what we really want patients and clients to focus on because they've seen the consequences of aging. They know people in their life who have had pretty terrible diseases or who have aged in a very aggressive way where they deteriorate quickly. And not only do they lose their quality of life, but in many cases, become a burden on the rest of their friends and family because of it. And most people are looking for solutions to just not end up this way. Most of us prefer to have a long life. Whether we live into our 80s or 90s or 100 plus, what we really are looking for is high quality of life for all of those years or as many of those years as humanly possible. We want our decline to be fast and swift. We don't want it to be long and drawn out. So taking major steps today to make sure that you're improving your quality of life in the future is really the way we all need to be looking at our health as a whole. In a lot of cases, we'll have a patient coming in, let's say either an older patient or sometimes it's not even an age-related thing, it's just a disease-related thing. And I'm having conversations not only with the actual patient, but whoever their caretaker is. Maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's one of their children, or in some cases, maybe it's a parent. But I'm not only assessing the patient's issues, I'm looking at, are some of these issues either uh, genetic or am I seeing certain signs and symptoms in this caretaker that are going to lead down a similar path? And I'm often trying to make them start thinking this way too, because I know that they need to take care of themselves in order to take care of their loved one. Or I know that they need to take care of themselves because they may be on a similar path and we want to hedge them and shift that path before they get too far down that road. And so I'm always obviously caring for the patient in front of me, but I'm also looking for opportunities to help their friends and family improve their health in a meaningful way. Those caretakers or family members or friends may have some resistance to the conversation. Listen, I'm here for so-and-so, which I totally understand. Or I don't have any diseases. I don't really need that. Or I'm actually pretty healthy. I don't think I need that therapy. And what I'm saying is you may be asymptomatic. You may not be actively complaining about a certain problem, but that doesn't make you healthy. There is a world of difference between being symptomatic or not and being healthy or not. And what we need to do is we need to drive people's health far beyond just asymptomatic. We need to drive people's health into a level of resiliency so that they can tolerate the stressors and the demands of their life in the next year, five years, 10, 20 years, et cetera. All these different therapies that we've been talking about on this channel, hyperbaric oxygen, red light therapy, different IV therapies, diet, fasting, all of these different things are not about curing disease. Even when we apply them to patients who have disease, it's never about treating disease. It's never about curing the disease. It's all about creating structured cellular adversity because cellular adversity leads to cellular change cellular change leads to improved health. The reason that aging is the number one risk factor for chronic illness, as our bodies get lazy and they don't get the same challenges over time and our life and our challenges get reduced and our diet gets more simple and our activity levels decrease and the stance that we take to protect our health reduces over time, it just makes us more vulnerable to disease as our years continue to progress. What we need to do is we need to create strategies of purposeful and controlled cellular adversity because that's what leads to promoting of health over time. So somebody could be five years older, 10 years older, and actually look back and say, wow, you know, I'm 10 years older, yet healthier and feel better and more vibrant than I was 10 years ago. There's virtually no one on planet Earth right now 
that is as healthy as they could be that couldn't use some sort of improvement. And so if we can change the paradigm and look at it through that lens, I think we can start to help people understand what the goals are and why we are recommending what services and therapies we're offering. Again, not to cure or treat disease, but to create that cellular challenge, that cellular adversity that's going to lead to improved health and therefore improved quality of life over time. Okay. So that's just a conversation about paradigm shifting with patients because this is important. It could be very difficult to get patients to commit to the level of care that you know that they need. However, what I often will say to people is, you know, if they knew what I knew about why I choose to do these therapies in my life, I'm not treating anything. I'm asymptomatic. And I'm also on this road to trying to improve my health over time because I know the moment I stop actively working on my health is also the day that I start losing my health. And I'm not willing to go through that. And so if I can help patients or potential patients understand where I'm coming from and why I do it for me, I think that helps them understand why they might want to consider it too. We are on a mission to make sure that the people looking for this information have access to it. I know that there's a lot of content out there, and I know that it could be very confusing when people are trying to find the answers that they're looking for, and it's really important for me that those people can find these answers. So when you like it, when you subscribe, and when you share these videos, that helps the people looking for this content know that they're getting a trustworthy source and they're getting the information that they're trying to find. So please do that and help us help other people. You know, and even when you're actively engaged in a conversation, and, and this might be dramatic, but I think it'll drive the thought process. You may have a patient, you know, says, you know, listen, I feel good. I'm fine. Nothing to complain about. Imagine somebody, so-and-so, they had a heart attack on Wednesday. How did they feel Monday and Tuesday leading up to that heart attack. In most cases, they felt great. They would have said, I feel fine. I'm healthy, right? What they're really saying is I'm asymptomatic. They felt on Monday and Tuesday the way they felt for two weeks, three weeks, or four weeks, or months, or years leading up to that. And then yet the next day, they actually had a heart attack. What we know about that heart attack is that heart attack didn't take a moment in time. Typically, that heart attack was an accumulation of various cellular changes over months and years leading to a final moment of dysfunction, and we'll call this a heart attack. So even though we associate that complication with a moment in time, the heart attack itself, the cellular changes leading to that heart attack took months and years, and you didn't feel any of them. And so we know, and this is just one example, but cancer is a similar scenario. Most autoimmune diseases are a similar example. Most of the time, we have these processes over weeks, months, and years that lead to a final point where once we are pushed over that point, we can now be diagnosed with a particular issue, even though that issue took such a long time to develop. It's helping patients understand that even though they are asymptomatic, there could be things going on inside their body. There probably are things going on inside of their body that are leading them down a road that's going to have an eventual ending in one of those other diseases that we know accumulate over time. And the sooner we understand that, and the sooner we take the active approach to dealing with it, the sooner we could actually make an impact in that person's life and steer the direction off of whatever road they might be on now to whatever road might help them improve their health and quality of life for the long term. Another objection outside of just not thinking that they're sick or that they're not treating anything, another conversation that you might have in your office would be potentially around money. A lot of these therapies could be costly. Most of them are not covered by insurance. And so here we are, I'm asymptomatic. I don't necessarily have a disease that I'm treating. And these are potentially expensive, non-insurance covered services. Why should I use them? The conversation has to be similar. It's not about taking time and money out of your life to treat this disease and illness. It's about taking time and money out of your life in order to protect yourself and to improve your health. Looking at it more like an investment in long-term health than an expense in your short-term health. So understanding the difference between expenses and investments are very important for people to understand. And what's more important than actually investing that time and money into your health? The thing about aging, disease, and money is that ultimately the overwhelming majority of people use up their last remaining dollars and assets in the remaining few years of their life. As quality of life and disease is now taking them over, and they virtually don't have much quality of life left. We are spending all of our last dollars 
on radical treatments or radical drugs or surgeries or anything that we can to just preserve an extra few months of life when we could have taken those same dollars, invested in them much, much earlier in our lifespan, not just to improve our lifespan or our longevity, but to improve our health span within those years that we have. Meaning if we're healthier for a longer period of time, the need to spend so much money, time and assets in those last few years should reduce dramatically. So I hope you find that helpful in your journey in terms of relaying some of this information to your patients or clients. You know, make sure you continue that conversation. It's really meaningful and patients need to understand that in order to commit to the types of programs that you're probably offering. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.